Got the honor of bringing up Andrew Picor now and Deborah DeSanzo, waiting in the wings. And we're going to talk a little bit about precision analytics and big data. It's a term you've heard a lot today, data, especially big data. And it is transforming medicine. I think we all acknowledge that. That's why we're here. But it's sometimes difficult for the non-mathematical types of the audience, and I put myself there, to grasp how these numbers roll out, how they can combat diseases, how they can recognize patterns, to dis dis create distinctions in ways that seem very opaque and cloudy to us. And nowhere is big data approach being more aggressively applied than in the treatment of cancer, which since I started doing my show almost 10 years ago, and I generally didn't talk about cancer except for prevention that much, today it becomes a good news story for a lot of people because they've got so many options out there, and big data driven one of that. And we'd love to take a little chance to, to explain it to you with two big change makers who are applying big data to cancer care. Uh, Deborah and Andrew, thank you for being here. Thank you. So uh, Andrew, I think you're going first. Yeah, I'm going to tee it off. So thank you to the Pontifical Council and Robin Smith and the Cura Foundation for the opportunity to present the work of CODA and IBM. You know, what an amazing time to be in the field of medicine and science. I won't recount everything that's been said over the last day and a half, but you saw the consequence of it in the last speaker, how emotional he became because there was something for his wife, obviously, who he loves dearly, that um, was transformative. And we heard, we saw, we've heard and seen so many transformative things. So while we're all excited about these advances, we are also rapidly approaching a crisis in, of, of unaffordability uh, globally in, in healthcare, particularly right now in the United States, as an example. And what we know now in the United States is $3 trillion are going to be spent on healthcare, and $1 trillion of that, we know, will be uh, spent on suboptimal care. And so if we want to be able to afford these incredible advances, we cannot afford to continue to pay for suboptimal care. And so that's what Deborah and I are here to tell you about, what we're doing to, to address this issue. And what we've come up with and developed, and we'll show you in a minute, is a practical and scalable solution to provide at the point of care real world evidence and expert experience so providers can make better choices and ultimately the plan is to put this in the hands of the patients. And we believe this approach can save up to 20% on total cost of care in the United States alone. Uh, we all recognize this simple concept, precision medicine. In the broadest sense, what you want to do is give the right therapy to the right patient. No one in the room would put their hand up and say, I want the wrong therapy for myself, right? Um, and if done routinely, this will actually enable uh, precision payment. So we match the payment for proper care. So you're not getting paid too much, you're not getting paid too little, you're getting paid just right. But if we don't know the upfront attributes that affect patient outcomes, you cannot choose the proper therapy or know the proper cost. This is hard to believe, but when you look at claims data, like ICD-10, in breast cancer, the only two things, as an example, that it will tell you, the code is, it's breast cancer, it's a woman, and where it is in the breast. It doesn't tell you anything else. There is more information on the barcode of an apple than there is in claims data. That barcode will tell you exactly what type of apple it is, where it came from, what its expected shelf life is, and other quality metrics. And we're talking about an apple. So what we set out to do was to change that. And instead of trying to boil the ocean with big data, what we decided to do was create a lens. And we call that the Coda Nodal Address. So a team of scientists and clinicians, experts, uh, from around the United States worked for three years to digitally map all of cancer. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that everything for a specific cancer in a specific circumstance that's relevant about you, including your age, your sex, your family history, uh, socioeconomic status when it's relevant, everything that's relevant about your disease, uh, its stage, uh, all the biomarkers, its genomics, where you are in the history of your disease, is it your first presentation, your second, your third, your fourth, and what is the intent of therapy has been embedded in a digital code for all of cancer. And we call this mapping. So all of cancer has been mapped, and all of behavioral health has been mapped, and the rest of medicine is in the process of being mapped. So what can you do with this? Well, we know this for a fact. All diseases are not the same. Not all patients are the same. Those are obvious. Not all doctors treat the same disease the same way. And the surprising one for some of you, I believe, will be that not all doctors treat the same disease the same way each time. We know that. Why? Why is that? So what we did is using the code nodal address, usually you hear when you go to a doctor that, well, you're an overutilizer or you're not doing it properly. You'll always hear my patients are sick or you're not accounting for everything. 
Well, that's, <laughs> that's what true. the code of nodal address does. It accounts for everything that the evidence and experts say is relevant for that disease in that presentation at that point in time. And so this is a list of code of nodal addresses. And you can see, for some of them, where you see all the green, there's uniform treatment. This is breast cancer and greenness hormone therapy. But for other code of nodal addresses, it's random. A small percentage get hormone therapy. Another percentage get very aggressive chemotherapy. A smaller percentage gets non-aggressive chemotherapy. Well, why would there be this difference for seemingly the identical patient? So what we did is we went uh, out, set out, and uh, went into a prospective payment program with Horizon Blue Cross to see at scale could our institution, Hackensack Meridian Health, working with CODA and with IBM, could transform healthcare so that we could identify this variance to prevent it, increase, improve clinical outcomes, and drive down the cost of care. And we actually launched this program. I'm going to show you some of the data real quick. And we presented this to CMS through PTAC and got a 9 to 1 vote to go forward as a demonstration project across the country. It's a very simple idea. Instead of on the far left where you have uh, nondescript people, claims data, you actually have all the digital information you could ever want about an individual. And then you look at a bundle is called a treatment of care that goes on for a year. A lane is what is the treatment, so is it hormone therapy, is it chemotherapy, and a sub-lane is which hormone therapy, there are 35 hormone therapies, which chemotherapy, there's 20 different types of chemotherapy regimens, all of which are approved, that you pick. And what we set out to do with the docs is we told them, we're going to get rid of the ones that don't give optimal outcomes, we're not going to look at costs at all, because we never want you to pick a less expensive approach to care that's going to sacrifice quality. But when we look at the non-quality, we'll cross them out, and then we'll look at cost. So 1,500 patients, this was expanded to 4,000 patients, and let me show you what, uh, what we found. So one interesting thing is you would think there's many, many of these cotinol addresses. They're not. There's something called biologic disequilibrium. So very briefly, things go to get together. So if you have, go together. If you have a small tumor, it's unlikely it's going to be highly aggressive, associated with a high oncotype DX score. If you have a large, rapidly growing tumor, vice versa, and on and on. And then where you are in a particular geography. So this is data from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, from uh, patients from the, those regions. They go to their doctors earlier, there's much more screening. If you go to other parts of the country, you might see a different distribution. But the point is, it's a limited number. And so the very simple concept is that the bundle, and this is a way to see it in your mind's eye, imagine a checkerboard. And the lanes go from top to bottom, left to right, and the sub lanes are each of the checks on the checkerboard. So say that first top lane is hormone therapy. The first, the first sublane could be tamoxifen, which is very inexpensive. The next one could be an aromatase inhibitor, a little bit more money. And the next one could be a much more newer and more expensive. And the chips represent the CNA's patients. And you can see a black chip is different than a blue chip. So what happens? So what we found was, not surprisingly, when we actually looked at three years of retrospective data, 4,000 patients, as depicted here, the chips were all over the place. And you can see that the blue chips weren't all stacked on the same sublane. They weren't even in the same lane. So we knew there was going to be variance. And don't worry about the numbers. I'm going to read this to you real quick. So the doctors demanded that we have 1,000 choices in breast cancer to give seven bundles, uh, 732 choices for colorectal and 11 for lung. And they said they couldn't do it without this. Well, they only used 18% the academic doctors of the choices and 10% in the community for breast, 45% for colorectal, 37 uh, for community, and 53 for lung, and 26 for community. So the doctors really didn't know what they did. They thought they needed all these choices, but they actually didn't. So then what we looked at is we looked at three things. We looked at frequency, we looked at a clinical outcome that was relevant, that everybody agreed was relevant, and we looked at total cost of care. And that's depicted here. And you can see that the, uh, the sublane that's highlighted, if all the blue chips were there, outcomes would improve and total cost of care would go down. And here are the data. So this is remarkable. Identical CNAs, meaning these are seemingly identical patients. So we broke it up, academic versus community, most common, mid-common, and least common, thinking that if you see it all the time, maybe there'll be a different choice behavior than if you see it infrequently. Um, 117 breast cancer patients, there were six, 16 different choices of therapy. These are the, seemingly the identical patients. 74 colorectal, 19 different choices. 
148 uh, lung cancer patients, 63 different choices. Now, mind you, there was no difference between academic physicians statistically and community-based physicians. When we went to mid-common, 18, 15, 21 patients, 11, 13, and 16 different choices. Even when you did uncommon CNAs, 11, 9, and 9, five choices, seven choices, and eight choices. Nine patients seemingly identical, eight different choices. This is a statement of human behavior that we've identified. And now the question is, can we use a tool that we've created to change it? Is there a consequence to this? This is the economics. For each of the bundles, it's on average plus or minus $180,000. So this is not plus or minus $5,000. So the variance in choice has, leads to a dramatic variance in expenditure. Could you imagine if we could take $50,000, $70,000 out of each one of these and add that up? You can see how you can get to a trillion dollars pretty quickly. So we introduced the tool, and what we found within three months, this is a representation of what happened, is we didn't, we're not 100% yet, but many more uh, patients of the same phenotype are getting the same care. And what we have seen is outcomes go up and costs go down. And it simply was having a tool at the point of care. Before you come on, just real quick. So I'm practicing, I see a patient who's a breast cancer patient. And I'm told she's actually in this category where this lane seems to provide the best care. Is, is that how it works? Yeah. And how do you know to intrude into my patient interaction? How do you know that this patient actually is in that lane or should be in that lane? So the, there are a number of attributes that uh, the data and expert physicians say you need to know. So in breast cancer, you need to know stage, estrogen status, progesterone status, and a bunch of other stuff. But it's about 15. But this is all entered before I see the patient. Correct. And it's not entered. It's actually extracted from the computer. Got you know, it. This, this, is, this is the big data part of things. So uh, in the EMR, the abstraction occurs automatically from the pathology report, from the x-rays. So the doctor is not doing anything. They just get a number, and then they can actually see the real-world evidence, and that's what Deborah is going to present, they can see, oh, in the last three years, for this particular type of patient, these were the choices I made, and this would appear to be the best choice for my patient. We don't tell doctors you have to choose this. We just show them the consequence of their prior actions on outcomes and cost to hopefully modulate their behavior, and the early returns are we are doing that. Okay, Deborah. Thank you, Dr. Pokora. Thanks for inviting me to speak with you. Thank you, Hackensack, for having me here as well. Um, so, we took CODA, and we have partnered it together with Watson for Oncology. So what I want to talk about first in Watson for Oncology, we talked a lot about this morning about um, can, we have access, can we have access to care in other parts of the world that can't have it. And really, if you think about it, the, what we're doing today with big data and AI is actually democratizing care and bringing insights and knowledge um, in the best possible treatments to parts of the world that um, cannot have it. So if we get cancer and we live in the developed world, if we live in, in Europe, um, for every oncologist, they have about 170 cancer patients. In the US, for every oncologist, there's about 143 cancer patients. Except in China, for every oncologist, there's 800 patients. In India, for every oncologist, there's 1,600 patients. In Africa, for every oncologist, there are thousands and thousands of patients. In cancer, there's 12,000 cancer diagnoses a day. And if you go, if you get breast cancer in China, this is somewhat your experience. You get your diagnosis, you go and queue up in a line at 8 o'clock in the morning, you wait a couple of hours, you sit in a large room, your oncologist comes around to see you, you get two to three minutes with your oncologist. So what we have done in China is we've brought Watson for Oncology. Watson for Oncology was um, really the thought of Memorial Sloan Kettering, who wanted to bring the knowledge of their best oncologists and democratize that knowledge to other parts of the world. So Watson was trained to understand patient attributes and then to provide the treatment recommendations that Memorial Sloan Kettering would provide. So far, we are in over 230 hospitals now. This is 25. We've actually treated um, 35,000 patients. But that's only from the Memorial Sloan Kettering guidelines. Now, with CODA, it actually gets much, much richer. 
This is a picture of Watson for Oncology. What you see here in the screenshot is actually for a, just as Dr. Pecora said, if you're a breast cancer patient, your attributes are read from the electronic health record. They're, they go into Watson for Oncology, and what Watson will give you is green, yellow, and red treatment op options, green being what Memorial Sloan Kettering would, would recommend the most. Now, along with that, you can get a whole host of other information, um, NCCN guidelines, AS ABSCO guidelines, but the most important is that now you will also get the real-world evidence from CODA. So, imagine that you're an oncologist in China or you're even an oncologist in Iowa. Perhaps you did not have access to the best breast cancer um, oncologists in the world you can use a tool that not only will provide you Memorial Sloan Kettering guidelines, NCCN guidelines, but actually all the great real world evidence that Dr. Pakora just talked about. It's tremendously, tremendously powerful. It's gonna help a lot of people and it already is helping a lot of people. I wanna give one more example of using pre precision medicine, big data and analytics. And this is actually in genomics. So again, if you're a cancer patient and you have the good fortune to have uh, gene sequencing done on your tumor, typically this process takes about 18 days after your biopsy has been, has been taken. The biopsy is read, it goes into a sequencer, a patient file comes out, and then someone has to read that patient file <coughs> and match it to appropriate drugs usually takes about 18 days. The last four to five days of that are actually in matching the patient file to medicines. What takes a human four or five days takes Watson for genomics two minutes. We take the patient file and we match it to available medicines. We did a study at University of North Carolina, 1,018 patients were analyzed. What we, what we were looking for is, can Watson accurately match patients to drugs? What the study found was that in 99% of the cases, we agreed with the tumor board. But Watson found, 300, found additional options in 324 patients, or 33% of the patients. And 98 of them had not had treatment, had not been given an option for treatment. After the study, 48 of them did get treatment. And we're very proud because not only do we see these results, but in the Biden Cancer Moonshot, we offered to sequence and match 10,000 veterans free of charge to medicines. So far, we're about 2,500 patients in, and, and um, we are matching veterans to medicines that they would otherwise not have had the opportunity to match to. And the quote here from Dr. Kelly, I think we agree with that we can't think of a better group of patients in this country who deserve the best oncology. And so there's much more, I'll, I'll stop there, but we, you know, there's so much said about artificial intelligence, there's so much said about big data, some of it good, some of it bad, but without a doubt, what artificial intelligence, big data can do is help us bring the best knowledge, the best insights, the best real world evidence, and the best treatment options to people who otherwise would not have gotten it. These are stunning presentations, uh, and they, in my mind anyway, create lots of questions. First, you used the word AI. I, I always thought AI was looking at disparate bits of data, randomly brought in, and you find patterns that no one would have expected. In fact, people who know AI who've tried to teach me, because I try my best to understand it, but it's a challenge, say that when you try to use rational thoughts to predict answers, you actually mess up AI, because unpredictable variables often come in. That's why I understand that Google fired its statisticians, because they were trying to predict the best algorithms for running ads, and when they started using AI, they started making a billion dollars a quarter more because they didn't have humans in the way of just raw predictions, because who would know that using a credit card at a sex might predict breast cancer for whatever crazy reason, um, and using cash wouldn't. So I made that up, by the way. So where's the AI part of this? So there's, a, so there's, there's, there's a, a number of different artificial intelligence techniques, and, and the ones, the two that we use most prevalent, and we use a lot of them, are natural language understanding and, and deep learning. So natural language understanding is what reads the electronic health record. Now, reading an electronic health record, actually, if you're a machine, if you're a human, isn't easy. I mean, there are thousands, <laughs> thousands of pages long, right? So, so um, Watson reads the electronic health record, and as Dr. Pakora said, lifts out the, 
if you if you're going to if you're going to match real world evidence or if you're going to um, provide a treatment recommendation, you need a set of features about that patient. Watson reads the thousands of patients, lifts it out. That's natural language understanding. Then you have to train you have to train the system to think like an oncologist or to find the real world evidence. Thinking like a college, we start with training cases. We, uh, Watson learns the training case from Memorial Sloan Kettering and then goes into, goes into the world. And you can't, however, if you have a thousand training cases for a breast cancer patient, there's going to be millions of breast cancer patients. And then the machine starts to reason so between is, them. So is natural language learning considered a form of artificial intelligence? It is, yes. Good, OK, I'm clear on that. And the second big question is, how do you take what's being done at Hackensack, for example, or that you're able to do now in China or with the VA, and make it standard of care for the entire country? If I'm at a really good hospital in the middle of the country, what does it take for me to be able to literally copy everything you're doing? Uh, I suspect the costs are there, but they probably are dwarfed by the savings. Well. Yeah, uh, no, the, it is dwarfed by the savings. But the thing is this, is that I want to go back to the data I presented, and we're about to publish this in a tier one journal. Human behavior here has been underestimated, all right? Doctors, particularly well-trained doctors, really do believe they know what they're doing. And uh, you, have to show them what they've, you have to show them what they've been doing. Um, and that's what the CNA allows you to do. It creates the lens. And going back to the AI piece, you're right. In a specific circumstance for a specific treatment, while diabetes may not be important, it may be important in that specific case. And knowing that as you're going in could modulate what you're going to do. So the whole idea is to optimize the care for the individual, the N of one, to the level of precision that science can take you with our knowledge today, iteratively learning with AI and big data so that you get it better and better. But then when you add up all those N of ones where you're avoiding unnecessary care, you're not doing things you shouldn't, you're doing things you should, we didn't even talk about that, the testing rate for in uh, non-small cell lung cancer in New York and New Jersey, uh, which should be 100% in certain circumstances, is only 70%. So that means 30% of people aren't even being tested for drugs that work profoundly better than chemo, as one small example. So it's, it's that sort of trusting your own data to start with that is the key. I get how this would work if we are pretty sure in the right things to do. But how do you make sure you don't stomp out the appropriate variability, the opportunity for innovative physicians to try new things, great ideas, prayer, herbs. In China, they have traditional Chinese medicine. They may not be seen as having a role, but if those aren't at least allowed, it becomes problematic. How is that forgiven? Do people get a chance to explain why they diverted? It's not that at all. It's actually, there's no prejudgment about what's right or wrong. What it is, it's a refined way of looking at the consequences of your choice and to see, is it really better? Yeah. Thank you both, Buck. Wonderfully done. Thank, Thank you. you.